Our silver comes from Mexico. Our cobalt comes from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. These are all places that are very, very far away from us. And yet the impact that we have from these materials affects our everyday life. Your cell phones, your cars, this television, all these lights, they're powered by it. And as we continue to need more and more and more of these materials, the simple question is, where do we get them from? Welcome to the Charles River Museum of Industry and Innovation and this mill talk on the hidden costs of a greener future. My name is Bob Perry and I'm the museum's executive director and our mill talks speaker series is made possible by the generous support of the extraordinary Lowell Institute that has been sponsoring free public lectures and other educational programs throughout greater Boston since 1836. Tonight's speaker, Dr. Thomas Villalon, is co-founder and chief technology officer of the young Massachusetts company Phoenix Tailings, a company on a mission to be the world's first clean mining and metals production company, eliminating untold millions of mining waste and CO2 emissions from the environment while sustainably isolating many useful, valuable materials. You almost certainly walked past our exhibit on Phoenix Tailings on your way to this space. They are the inaugural subject of our new exhibit series that we call Course Correctors. Companies that are mitigating the historically destructive effects of industry are course correctors. Pollution and climate change are substantially the result of the rapid advancements and proliferation of industry at just about every level. Advancement and proliferation that was allowed to occur with scant regard to the negative effects of industries that have otherwise radically improved human lives over the last two centuries since this very textile mill launched the American Industrial Revolution. Phoenix Tailings was founded to help the world correct our course in the way we mine and isolate crucial elements, powerfully supporting our collective effort to minimize humanity's destructive ecological impact on the earth and hopefully reverse it over time. And tonight's speaker is personally responsible for many of Phoenix Tailings' process breakthroughs that are getting them and will be getting us where we need to be. Dr. Thomas Villalon has dedicated his life to solving the issues of the mining and metals industries. He received his Bachelor of Science degree from MIT and his PhD from Boston University. He went on to co-found Phoenix Tailings in 2019 with the mission of building the world's first fully clean mining and metals production company. Tomas is an expert in the sustainable extraction of critical minerals from tailings and environmentally responsible rare earth mining, or uh, excuse me, refining. If you're not quite sure what all that means or how it's even possible, well, you've found yourself in the right place at the right time. Please welcome Dr. Tomas Villalon. Thank you very much. All right, can everyone hear me? All right, excellent. So first of all, thank you all for coming out this evening. I know that you all have busy schedules, so I greatly appreciate the time and opportunity to speak with you all. Bob, thank you very much for the introduction. I greatly appreciate that. And so we're going to start just with the concept of the talk, the hidden costs of a greener future. And as we think about this question of electrification, as we think about the future of energy, we have to recognize that there are complexities that come with it, some of which are very upfront to us and others which, candidly, we'll never hear about because it doesn't affect us personally. But as we move forward and as we have now a global society, we have to understand the ramifications of what we are doing so that we can work to mitigate them and, in wherever possible, to course correct, to actually use the advances in science and technology to undo what we have done. So. Before we go any further, I think some context is always important. Why am I invested in this? And I'll just start very simply. I am what's called a Tejano. I'm from South Texas and Northern Mexico. Uh, as you can tell by my accent and the accents in my name, probably that general area is acceptable if you're looking at a map. Now, more importantly though, as a professional, I'm a scientist and an engineer. 
I love handling these hard problems, these difficult problems that we're facing with today's society. And candidly, science is just what I enjoy doing. So why not make the most of what I'm given the opportunity to do? And then on a last note, I'm a conservationist at heart. If you want to find me at my happiest, it's on a horseback in the middle of absolute nowhere, looking at the trees, looking at nature, looking at rocks. So in a way, everything that I do is focused on this theme of conservation. It's focused on this theme of how do we make the world a better place. Now, as for where I'm from, this is a bit more personal. So why am I in this career? What drove me to do this? And these are two examples, one called Cementville and the other called Monterrey. So about a five minute drive from my family's house in San Antonio, Texas, there is an old quarry pit. It's the old Alamo quarry. And the Alamo quarry operated for about a hundred years and some of my distant relatives worked in the cement plant. It's as simple as that. And it was the environmental, or excuse me, it was the economic heart, but also the environmental problem. To this day, there is a pit the size of about a mile in diameter that's a gouge in the landscape. But they did what they had to do in order to build a local city, to build a local ecosystem to what it is today. And then for the rest of my family in Mexico, in Monterrey, you see the issue right there. That is not clouds. That is a layer of smog. I used to call it when I was a kid, pea soup, because that made it a little bit easier to understand, but that is sulfur, nitrogen, particulates, you name it. It's been there for over 100 years, and candidly, it's going to be there for another 100 years because it is a consequence of what they do for their livelihood. It is a consequence of the steel mills. It is a consequence of the aluminum mills, the copper mills, all of the industry that is required for a city of over 4 million people to maintain their standard of living. And for us, to maintain our standard of living as a consequence of that. Now, this is the past. Let's think about the future for a moment. The future is green. You see the solar cells. That is an image of a prototype fusion reactor right there. The solar cells, I'll tell you, we know how to make them work. We know their efficiencies. We know the engineering. We know the scale. We know how to make these things operate. It is a viable path forward. Fusion's a little bit more prototype, but we're beginning to see the first pieces the ability to actually make this clean energy, to crack the nut on how to reduce our dependency on hydrocarbons. So you see two solutions, and they're not exclusive of each other. They can work together in harmony. We just have to develop the materials. We have to develop the engineering and the infrastructure needed for it. And more importantly, as we'll get into the topic here, we need the materials that feed these solutions. So, just a very, very, very high level summary. What is electrification? Electrification is this idea that we are moving from one energy source, hydrocarbons, oil, natural gas, shale, to a cleaner source, electricity. Could be hydro, could be solar, could be whatever variation, but we want to remove our dependency on this stuff. For context, every country in the world, wherever possible, has a strategic oil reserve. That is how important energy is for us. We have to have a reserve. So then how do we start building that and the associated technologies for it for our electrification? And there's two examples here. EV, that's a really easy one. Tesla, Ford, Toyota, you're seeing electric vehicles being generated at a rate that was unthinkable over a decade ago. And ironically enough, they've been around since the early 1900s. Edison actually had electric cars at the turn of the 20th century. It just turned out that making gas cars work was a heck of a lot easier and more convenient. But now we're seeing a resurgence in the technology. Another interesting one, an electric plane. Uh, jets and planes in general are one of the hardest things to decarbonize, but this plane is called Alice. And Alice had her maiden voyage approximately two to three weeks ago. So you're beginning to see the infancy of these additional methods of transportation where you no longer need hydrocarbons, where you no longer need fuel as we know it. You're now beginning to see the change that electricity and all of our efforts is bringing about. Now, with every good thing, there's a catch. You do not get free lunch in this life. 
and the green energy transition is part of that equation. So very simply put, big oil will be replaced by big shovel. So I always think a little show and tell is important. This right here is a representation of one pound of crude, okay? So this is the basis for almost all of our energy needs currently. This right here is something fresh off the factory floor. This is six pounds of neodymium metal. This is the first commercial, excuse me, this is the first commercial neodymium metal made in the US in over 45 years. I know because one of my old mentors actually used to do it for GM back in the day. This is six pounds right here. This is the ratio you're looking at. For every one pound of hydrocarbon that you eliminate, it's about six pounds of metal. So I'll give you an idea of the ratio. Now, in a practical sense, the reason why oil is so easy, you put a straw on the ground and Texas tea comes out the other way. It's as simple as that. Metals, all right, now we have to, put, now, now we have to put our backs into it. So, where's the impact? What actually happens? Where does these things come from? This doesn't appear out of thin air. And candidly, because of global political trends and because of economic trends, the global south, this is where the impact's gonna be. Our copper comes from Chile. Our silver comes from Mexico. Our cobalt comes from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. These are all places that are very, very far away from us. And yet the impact that we have from these materials affects our everyday life. Your cell phones, your cars, this television, all these lights, they're powered by it. And as we continue to need more and more and more of these materials, the simple question is, where do we get them from? So before we get to the where part, let's start with the how much. So this is a beautiful graphic. And for context, iron and iron related materials are the largest consumed metal on planet Earth. You're looking at 2.6 billion tons. That is an astronomical number. But as we start looking at some of these more critical materials, the electrification materials, copper's 21 million tons. So we go down a couple of orders of magnitude. And then we start seeing some other ones pop up. You see nickel, 2.7 million tons. And we're gonna get into the relevance of some of these materials shortly. And then way, way over here, these technology and precious metals. Only within the past 15 years have these become truly important to us. And if you look right here, rare earths, 280,000 tons. You look right here, cobalt, 170,000 tons. We're starting to get to really, really small amounts. And what that means on the back end is that the amount of material you have to go through is that much higher. So let's take a step back into time. Let's go to one of my favorite metals, copper, okay? Again, 21 million tons roughly on a yearly basis. And so how do we actually make copper? Well, one, you get the copper ore out of the ground. Okay, that's fairly easy. But then there's a second half of the equation. You now have to turn the copper ore into metallic copper. And there are vast facilities that are designed to do this. They're specialized. But I wanna go back in time. This is Pliny the Elder, a Roman era writer, historian, politician, he basically did everything. And in one of his works, De Nature, in book 34, he notes copper ores, cadmea, another word for copper ore that they used, smelted, furnace. And it's not in this particular excerpt, but they use the word charcoal. They knew how to refine copper. They did it on their mass scale. So then the question I ask myself as a scientist is, well, how do we make copper? How is it different? And the fact of the matter is, a good chunk of the world's copper is still made the exact same way. They use coal, metallurgical grade coal. They use a giant furnace. 
they use copper ore. I don't see a difference. It's bigger, they've made it more efficient, but fundamentally at its core, that's 2,000 years ago. Okay, so we have to start thinking now, not just how do we source the materials, but also how do we make it? And the relevance for us here in the US is actually quite interesting because there are three copper smelters left. And of the three, one has been on the verge of shutting down for the past 20 years, and no one can get a permit to get another copper smelter up. So the US actually does not list copper as a critical material because we have vast stores of it. But just because you have the material doesn't mean you can actually do anything with it unless you can make it into a metal. So, okay, let's go one step further back. Let's look at the grand scope of the problem. We have electrification targets to bring our carbon numbers to net neutral by 2050. Okay, that's the target, 2050, 26 years. So, one, in human history up to this point, we have mined 700 million tons of copper. Again, just this astronomically large amount. Now, on a more immediate basis, copper has a very interesting name in the commodity industries. It's called Dr. Copper. Why Dr. Copper? Because it's used to forecast the health of an economy. When you have a good, strong economy, copper prices follow it because a lot of these goods are, shall we say, they're goods that a strong economy is able to purchase. If your economy isn't strong, you're not gonna buy the fancy light bulbs. You're not gonna buy the fancy copper-based electronics. But when your economy is strong, you will. And then more relevant for the context of the 2050 target, copper is the future of electrification. So you have the future in electrification and you have the present in the strength of an economy. And I mean, we can all accept that copper is pretty important for electrification because all of our houses, all of our electronics have copper wires. So if you don't have copper, how are you gonna transfer the electricity? Now, the real issue is this. To hit our 2050 target for electrification, we have to mine and refine 1.4 billion tons of copper twice the amount in 26 years that we've done in human history, in 10,000 plus years. Yeah, that's a statistic right there for you. That being said, if, we're, if there's one thing we found that we're really good at, when we've got a target and when we've got, a, when we've got an economic basis to do it, we'll figure it out. That's not the question. But let's think pragmatically for a second. We're talking infrastructure projects. We're talking whole societal shifts in terms of how we think, how we operate, how we, have, how we use the technology that's available to us. And on top of that, let's just face facts for a second here. Again, the US has reserves of copper, but where's the rest of it coming from? So some brief statistics. 65% of copper comes from areas that are high water risk. Uh, Chile is a great example of this. In Chile, there's a mine called Escondida. It supplies 7%, one mine, 7% of the world's copper supply. It's in the middle of a desert. 47% of copper is on or near indigenous lands. There's a project in Arizona right now, the Resolution Copper Mine, if I remember properly, and they've been working on it for 10 years. And the Native Americans recently stalled the project because it's on their lands and they didn't feel like they were getting a fair deal from the mine. Okay, so now you've got political issues that come with it. 64% of copper sits in areas of biodiversity. Okay, now we got another wrench. This is an ecological problem as well. And then lastly, speaking on just a political spectrum, 50% of copper sits in areas with fragile political situations. One of the largest copper mines that just turned online is in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which has a stellar record for stability. So the problems just keep piling up. And again, the only reason we don't see it is because it just doesn't affect us here in this particular situation. So, okay, that's copper, fine. We'll, we'll, we'll find a solution for copper. We can figure it out. We'll use aluminum, we'll use some other metal. Okay, let's look at an EV battery pack. You need 29 kilograms of nickel, eight kilograms of cobalt, six kilos 
of lithium. Let's talk about nickel for a second here. How many of y'all like fish? Just raise of hands. Cool. So do the Indonesians. Indonesia is one of the largest suppliers of the world of nickel. And these are their waters. That red is from the iron that's contaminating their water. I saw a documentary recently, and one of the most interesting points was that a fisherman was interviewed and asked, how has mining changed your life? And he goes, well, I used to go out half a kilometer to get to clean water for my fish. Now I have to go out one and a half to two kilometers to get clean fish. Okay, well, environmental issue, social issue. There's another end to it. Uh, to do nickel refining, you need sulfuric acid more often than not. How the heck are you going to get that much sulfuric acid on a chain of islands? Well, in the middle of the Pacific Islands, there's a volcano called Kawaijin. Kawaijin is one of the only volcanoes in the world that is sulfur based. They mine the sulfur by hand. And what you see right there, that vent is where liquid sulfur pours out, and on top, you see the fumes. Those fumes turn into sulfuric acid on contact with air. So that equipment and that man has a lifespan now. Okay, so the nickel now suddenly is problematic. Your cobalt. I'll cut to the quick. Most of the, most of the cobalt in the world comes from coltan. It's from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And based on the situation there, it's child labor. It's pit mining. They don't have the sophisticated tools or the capital to actually move forward on some of these projects. All right, lithium. This one's the trickiest one, in my opinion. There's no direct human cost up front. But what you see here are lithium brine pits. That is, I believe, a mine in Chile as well. So this one is a bit more of a long-term issue. You see the colors that those pits have. Those colors are indicative of metals besides lithium that are dissolved in the brine. And over time, they'll percolate into the sand. And these ain't, these ain't the metals you want. Some chromium, some iron, some vanadium. So yes, it's a desert, but the elements that were formerly in the ground that were reasonably sequestered now have made an already inhospitable environment dang near impossible to function on. Life will go on, to be clear, but not in the same way as that environment knew originally. And as these societies begin to move out further and further into the desert, they may encounter the ramifications of that. So again, not an immediate issue, but it is one that we have to think about the long-term ramifications for. So, we'll talk about one more, and this is the metal of interest that Phoenix Tailings works with. It's called the rare earth metals. To be clear, these metals are neither rare, nor are they dirt, are they earths. It's just a horrific name that we mistranslated from when the Europeans, the Swedish in particular, figured out what they were. And we have four metals of interest. The rare earths are 17, of which the four are that we care about, praseodymium, neodymium, terbium, and dysprosium. These metals are the key to every major magnet that we make that is needed for electrification. For your EVs, for your wind turbines, for anything that has what's called a high power density, you need these. And this is the issue with the rare earths. Uh, it, it was a move in the late 1980s by Deng Xiaoping, uh, the premier of the CCP in China at the time, and he is quoted as saying, Saudi Arabia has oil, China has rare earths. They knew that this was something that would be of vital importance at some point. So they developed the monopoly around it. They have 60% of the world's mineable reserves that are currently open. They also have 95 to 99% of the refining capacity in the world. And here's the problem. All of the technology associated with the rare earths was developed at least 50 years ago. At least. Some of the technology is older than 100 in some cases. So you're trying to do very sophisticated mining with technologies developed around the time of Thomas Edison. 
Well, if you're willing to deal with the environmental consequences as well as the uh, consequences of dealing with the people and the land, all right, that's a fair shake. But 2,000 tons. To give you an idea, this is six kilos, right? For every, for every kilogram that I have of this, I'm gonna have over a metric ton of waste associated with it. So this right here in my hand, there's six tons of waste somewhere because of current practices. And just to give you an idea, this is the Bayanobo mine. This is the largest rare earth mine in the world. You can see all of the ore bodies, you can see the pits, but if you look right here on the fringes, you see the tailings pits. These tailings pits right here are three miles long. I count one, two, three, four at least. That's a photo from about seven years ago. So if we want to bring these materials back, if we want to mine them anywhere else in the world, how can, how can we do this? What's the path to move forward? Talked about the waste. This is just another metric right here. Just the magnets in a Prius is four tons of waste. So let's, let's go back to this for, for one moment. You know, what are we mining? Okay, so the rare earths are, are the outliers. They're one of the extremes. They're a lot of waste for a little amount of material. Well, we mine a lot of other materials. It's, there's there's got to be some better metrics. And the answer is yes, but there's still tailings for all of these things. So to give a rough idea, for the 3 billion tons of metal produced in 2021, there were 13 billion tons of tailings. So large, large quantities of these materials are made on, an, on a yearly basis. For context, I don't like this metric, but it's the closest that we could conceive of. It's, it's 39,000 Empire State Buildings. Again, that's just unfathomable. How, how, how do you even put that in context? Now, this is just a graphic to give you an idea of the volume. So you're looking at right here, roughly four miles up by four miles across by four miles deep on a yearly basis. That's how much we make. Now, let's think about moving forward about this. What, what can we do about this? There's so much waste. If we take a step back for a moment, we can think about the value that's in them. Because the one thing that mining never was really good at is how do you get secondary value out of the waste products that you originally threw away? And so when we started Phoenix Tailings, this was just after a major dam failed in Brazil, Brumalginho. Colossal, colossal spill. And we sat around a table for a minute and said, okay, we have to make a difference here. There is an opportunity, there is a demand. How do we go about this in a responsible manner? And so we really had two principles. One, we have to eliminate waste. There is no two cents about it. We are already, we are already making enough, we're not gonna add to the pile. It's as simple as that. How can we take something that is already being thrown away, something that is a problem, something that is neglected, and get value out of it. And the second is we want it to be closed loop. We want nothing, absolutely nothing that we make to have a negative impact on anyone around us, be it the environment, be it people, be it ecology. It's a pretty tall ask, but we have to go about doing it. And I had a moment of inspiration during my PhD. Um, Candidly, I spent nine months on one reaction. And every time the reaction happened, it would blow up, and I would go to my advisor and I would go, what's going on here? And he goes, this is science. This is just what happens. And I will never forget, it was trial number nine. It was about one trial a month. I actually got fed up pouring in my reagents because in the back of my head, I said to myself, it's gonna blow up anyways. It's gonna be another failed experiment. So I 
there was one chemical that I just put too much in. And I said, meh, whatever. Threw it in the reactor. And I come back the next day, and I had my cleaning set up ready to go. Everything was ready, because I had done this six plus times already. I wanted to minimize the amount of pain I was going to go through. And I open up the reactor, and it was stable. I took the rest of the day off, but <laughs> that moment right there led to another four months of figuring out what the heck just happened. There's no documentation on this. I can't figure out heads or tails of this. And what I found was in chemistry, there is a term called a complex. We'll get to that in a second. And I found out that this disilicate, this form of the chemical that I was making, just made my reaction blow up. But when I had the orthosilicate form, all of a sudden it just worked. And I'm sitting around the table discussing this with friends, you know, my co-founders, and it's like, well, what if we just try this method? And we started finding that there were these forms of rare earths that actually worked. They weren't documented, they weren't cataloged, but they were dissolving when they weren't supposed to dissolve. They were behaving in ways that no one had ever seen before. I've run experiments where my previous literature references say, this cannot be done. And yet I'm looking at the data in front of me and says, no, that, that actually just happened. So we call this predictive complexation, the ability to predict what some of these complexes do. And in a nutshell, this is basically what it is. When you see a chemical reaction, you see the beginning and you see the end, the reagents and the products. But what happens here in the middle this reaction, this pathway, that's really the key there. Because this reaction can proceed six, seven, ten different ways. But when you care about the precision of a reaction, when you care about how efficient it needs to be, you really want this form right here, the one on the right. Because that one isn't going to make the reaction properly happen. So now we can predict what some of these very exotic compounds are going to do. We can predict what a reaction should do despite there being little to no data on it. And so this is how we've gone from this, that is a set of Chinese rare earth metallization cells. Open top, not great ventilation. It's a homebrew operation. And this is a photo of our actual facility in Burlington. This metal right here came out three days ago from that cell. We're operating in Boston. I can keep track of how much electricity is going through my system. I can keep track of all of the chemicals going in, the chemicals coming out. This is now becoming a closed loop system. This is becoming efficient because we've designed it to be that way. So if we take a step back then, let's think about how rare earths are produced, right? There's so much waste. How can we deal with this? One, start with tailings. There's a lot of waste out there and some of it is really, really rich with rare earths not rich enough to be used by conventional standards, because again, you're using 100-year-old technology, but we've got new techniques, we've got new methods. You don't, you don't need something that is that rare earth rich anymore. Okay, so we get to our extraction right here, our first set of processes. We take the tailings in, we mix them in with our mix of liquids, and we can selectively pull the rare earths out. We can make them soluble, water soluble, when they're not supposed to be. Okay, so now we've got the rare earths, but the problem is, like I said earlier, you have all 17 in a bunch. Now we go to separation. Here we have a technique called solvent extraction. This is something done on the thousands and thousands and thousands of ton scale industrially for copper, for nickel. The equipment already exists. Okay, let's change the chemistry. Let's change the way that the internals operate. And in doing so, we can make the process more efficient. You get the selectivity. You can pull out the rare earths that you want more easily. All right, now we've got the pure rare earth. We have the neodymium. We have the terbium. Now we need to make it into metal because that's what the magnets are made out of. So now you go into our metallization cell. And you can efficiently convert that oxide into a metal, like that slab you just saw right there. Let's go one step further. I like thinking big. I like thinking stupid, in a sense. What's the craziest thing that you can do conceivably? Well, we have a lot of carbon dioxide. Fantastic. Let's make it useful. Thanks to uh, a grant through ARPA-E, 
they gave us a chance to do so. So we'll go back to that nickel, we'll go back to that problem of you have all of these really corrosive chemicals needed to actually process it. What if we could use carbon dioxide as the chemical for it? Kill two birds with one stone. The carbon dioxide gets trapped in the nickel rock and you get the nickel out. Well, based on our estimates right here, we call this process CO2 gone because acronyms are a fantastic thing. You can sequester five and a half tons of carbon dioxide per ton of nickel made. This is something we're proving out in the lab right now. Imagine going to a facility and saying, hey, I want your, I want your flu stack. I want all the carbon dioxide that comes off of it. Give me every single bit of it. Why? Do you want nickel or not? That's my problem to fix. It's being creative with the problems we currently have and making them work in our favor. Just another, just another CO2 gone thing. So we're looking at five and a half tons. The other thing is you have to be comparable to what industry already does. So we're looking at 80% nickel recovery. The goal in, in this entire process is again, to sequester the carbon, to get the nickel out, and any other minerals that'll come with it. It's not just nickel. Copper behaves similarly, of all things. We, I originally tested this process on copper. Cobalt behaves similarly. Silver, molybdenum, tungsten. Prove it with one thing. Show that it works. Because industry doesn't like taking huge risks, but if you can demonstrate that it works on one thing, okay, make it bigger, move on to the next. Make things modular, make things easy for industry to accept. So, the grand vision. It was said at the very beginning, no waste. We want to make the materials that we need for electrification without any waste. It's as complicated and as simple as that statement. So where are we at today then? Well, we have a site in upstate New York. That's our tailing site. It's where we're looking to start doing our piloting work. And then we have a commercial producing facility. We've been able to make the metal. We've been able to separate the oxides. Every little bit adds up in this. Every point of data, every contact, every action will have positive benefits. It just has to move forward in a consistent direction in order to do so. And then where are we going? Grand master plan, spoken hub model. We want one central facility because we can control the materials much better there. And then from there, give me all the tailings that you can. I want it all. There's so much material out there. Just think about it, a tenth of a percent. A tenth of a percent times a million tons? That's an infathomable quantity for certain metals, for you, especially your technologically precious ones. So we're just gonna start wrapping things up a little bit here. Simply put, we want a green future. I think we can all agree on that here, but it shouldn't come at the expense of, any, of everyone else. Just because someone's out of sight doesn't mean that they're out of mind. And our actions do have consequences, positive and negative. This is an us problem, right? This is technology. Technology is a portion of the solution. If I were to take a step back and kind of dis and explain some of the problems I've heard from other colleagues, we don't talk about metals in the US anymore. Mining is a four letter word. Mining is verboten. That's a problem because we need these materials. You know, there's the old, uh, in Chomsford of all places, there's an old lead mine. Well, lead tends to have some antimony in it. Lead tends to have some selenium with it. Those are pretty important things. If you go look at the list of critical materials, they pop up there. Okay, well, you have the source, but how do we do it responsibly? And that's part of the question that we're answering right now and that we want to bring up, we want to promote. Because again, this is an us problem. So on top of that, we have to support the education of mining, the education of smelting. Mostly because I think there's 11 programs in the US left. Think about this for a second. 60 years ago, the US was the leading producer of almost every metal known in the world. Now we're probably in charge of three. Now that's not a knock on 
the benefits that it's brought to us, but at the same time, we want to be conscious in moving forward, which means we have to be responsible in how we mine and how we smelt and how we move forward as a society. And you're not gonna get there without education. The Bureau of Mines closed in the 1990s. How are you going to advance if you don't have a Bureau of Mines? How are you going to advance if you don't have the education, the workforce to sustain any of these efforts? So that's a problem that's actually being dealt with right now. The US government just issued a major grant for mining and metallurgical education. Now we have to wait a decade. That's the timeline for these things. Another thing, just awareness. Who's talking about these problems? Just politicians are, some NGOs. But if we make this an us issue, suddenly it becomes more vocal, suddenly it becomes something that people cares about. And once you have care, you have traction. And then being thoughtful and innovative. Pliny wrote how we mined copper. Let that sink in for one second. And we're still doing it the same way to a lesser or greater extent. We like to think we'd be technologically better than the Romans, but I'm not entirely sure about that one at the moment. But let's think about what a concerted effort does for one second here. How long did it take for a vaccine for coronavirus to reach trialing? Months. How long did it take for society to get a nuclear reactor working? Years. 1942 was when the first nuclear pile went online. We had a reactor within a decade. We have the ability. Look at history. Look at this room. Look at everything around us. If there's a concerted effort, it is not a matter of if, only when. So make this an us problem. And over time, those 26 years, that target isn't just attainable. It'll be something that we'll look fondly back at. All right, so that's basically it. Thank you all for y'all's time. Um, I have a question. Yeah, of course. You say give me all the tailings mm -hmm. you can. They're scattered throughout the world. Mm -hmm. How do you plan on relocating them or do you do the work at those locations? Fantastic question. So I probably went over it a little bit more quickly than I should have, but again, that hub and spoke model, you want one centralized facility for all of the refining, making the metal, but each tailing site is gonna have its own, we call them extraction sites. So you can process the tailings there, upgrade your concentrates, and then you make aggregates, you make iron concentrates that can be sold into the local economy. Okay, how much waste do you see after you, um, I guess, expand on the tailings for what you want? None. There'd be no waste. The tar the, the, waste into less waste. The, 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 the target is absolute oh, is, zero. I know, mm -hmm. but is there any waste at all left? There, there won't be. There won't be. There won't be. Let's think about this for a second, right? Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll throw an interesting example for you. Um, cement. The highest tonnage man-made material in the world has a shortage right now of sand, of aggregate. What do you mean there's no sand? There's a technical reason for it, but there are entire countries right now who... Good sand. Exactly. There are entire countries who are importing in good sand, if you will, right now. Well, if we make aluminosilicates, if we make quartz, how do, we, how do we make that into something that can be used as aggregate? Maybe not cement, road base. There's infrastructure everywhere. So it's a, lo it's a local economy issue. And the cost of moving these materials is really expensive relative to the actual value. So as long as that material is acceptable for that application, use it there. The luminosilicates are a very widely used product right now. Uh, if, you, if you were to actually go and to you know, strip out the roads, you would find probably a layer of that material or something similar as a road base when they're actually paving everything over. So it's finding the right application for everything as well. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Um, so at the beginning of your talk, mm -hmm. uh, you made an equivalence between the bottle of crude oil and the bag of neodymium that 
Mm -hmm. I really didn't understand because crude oil isn't consumed and the neodymium goes into infrastructure. Whoa. Okay. So could you explain that? Yes, yes, yes. So, so in an energy equivalent, right? If, 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 I were to, if I were to wave a magic wand right now and, tr and replace all of my crude oil energy reserves and mechanisms with an equivalent electrified basis, so, so basically, if I, if, I converted, if I converted all standard cars tomorrow to electric vehicles, if I were just to do that overnight, for every one pound of gas, if you will, I would need to replace it with six pounds of metal. Oh, mm -hmm. I, I still don't get it. The gas yeah, yeah, gets, yeah, yeah, okay. Is, so, is, is, for like every one pound of vehicle? Or? Uh, for every one pound of crude oil itself, for every crude oil derivative. So, try thinking of, try, try thinking of it this way, right? At its core, energy is just how, energy is nothing more than electrons stored in a particular form, right? So in the case of crude oil, my electrons are stored in a liquid form, okay? Okay, so the neodymium is representing the, the electricity stored in the battery. Effectively, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So does this, do these processes you're working on, um, do they have any application on nuclear waste? Oh boy, loaded question. From a purely metallurgical perspective, yes. Now, there is a lot more regulatory that's involved. In principle, this is actually something interesting you, you talk about. Some of the original rare earth processes were actually made for, for refining uh, thorium and uranium back in the day. So, so, those, so those extraction processes that the Chinese use currently, that was used to refine uranium and thorium. They were just transferred to work for rare earths. So what we're doing is we're going, we're figuring out how to efficiently mine the rare earths. And if the opportunity were to arise, and if all regulations, if all permits, if everything lines up perfectly, then it is something that could be applied technologically. Sounds like a reach. Everything's a reach, I guess. Everything's a reach. What I, what I always like to say is that really it's regulation. Technology can do anything. Technology is not limited by bounds. But once you bring in regulation, especially with things as sensitive as nuclear materials, that's where you have to be very, very careful and precise. One more question. Mm -hmm. um, the attempt to locate gold mines in various sensitive areas mm -hmm. has received a lot of attention. In the process of applying these various technologies, is there, is there a way to improve the mining of things like gold so it doesn't produce the acid waste uh, that's so objectionable? Yes. Uh, that is a fantastic question right there. So that CO2 gone process that you saw, one of the offshoots for it is for those types of materials. They're called mafic rocks typically. And right now, a lot of the world's gold reserves are actually in those bodies. And so the reason they have so much waste is that they just need to go through a lot of material and they have to use a lot of acid. Whereas for us, those mafic rocks are treated with carbon dioxide instead. So the application, again, is there. I'd love to try a sample. Just no, no material has come in the door specifically looking for gold. Most of our gold is actually covered, covered from old tailings and heap leaching. Mm -hmm. They don't use acid, they use cyanide. Yep. That's not a problem. As far as nuclear waste go, mm -hmm. under the rule of Jimmy Carter, Mm -hmm. decided we would store our nuclear waste painting a primary storage spot which hasn't, hasn't been picked. Mm -hmm. So we have low level and mostly and high level radiation waste in every nuclear facility in the country sitting there mm -hmm. uh, waiting to be, it, it can all be reprocessed and other countries do it. 
Yes, so, okay, so, so to your first point, yes, uh, gold is recovered from tailings via cyanide processing. That is a thing. However, new gold deposits are, tip, are I think it's 60% of new gold deposits are referred to as refractory deposits. Cyanidization actually doesn't work on them either because there's carbon in there or because the sulfur matrix actually fully traps the gold within it. One of the difficulties, especially with opening new gold mines with these refractory ores, is also the capex associated, the capital cost associated with it. Because there are methods to treat them, they're just extremely energy and capital intensive. To your second point, uh, yes, the reprocessing of nuclear fuels is something done primarily by Canada and Europe. The Russians also do it too. Again, that's more of a regulatory thing. Um, if you were to go into fine, finer detail, you reach the issues of law, low activity waste, and all of its derivations. And the nuclear space really is hampered right now, in my opinion, by a lot of the regulatory because it's so complex and every country has its own variation of it. So just because your country is willing to work with it one way doesn't mean that a neighboring country wants to work with it that way though. Again, technologically, there's nothing ever stopping you, but tell that, you know, tell that to the regulatory agencies, certainly. I'd like to respectfully challenge your uh, thesis that the world is going completely to electrification, which mm -hmm. sort of ignores the second law of thermodynamics. Mm. 60% 60 60 of the energy used by buildings in both the Northeast, which goes all the way to Philadelphia, and uh, the upper Midwest, which includes places like Chicago, is used for heat. Mm -hmm. We don't need to fight with heat pumps and mm -hmm. you know, air source heat pumps at low efficiencies Mm -hmm. to uh, get that heat. We can do this with direct solar. Mm -hmm. The feasibility of this was proved in a project uh, in 25 miles south of Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Mm -hmm. We're talking serious north. Mm -hmm. We're talking 50% more heating energy use in the winter than we use around mm -hmm. here. And this particular project supplied, again, it's still in operation, but the five years they measured it, supplied 95% of the energy from solar. The <laughs> economics weren't quite there. They figure on a larger scale <laughs> they could do it. I've done some estimates that indicate we could save 100 million tons of CO2 <laughs> with a more advanced version of that uh, system using both direct solar and capturing the heat from building air conditioning systems and data center air conditioning you know, just over the US and then mm -hmm. if we add in other heat sources, mm -hmm. we might be able to double that. And I think we could do it at pretty close to costs that are competitive with natural gas today. So my one question, and that's an interesting case study you bring up, what's the thermal fluid in a, in a system like that? Water, water. Okay, okay, so, so, so. We so you have it, it's cheap, it's available. It's, it's slightly it's... corrosive, but here's mm -hmm. the beauty. You're gonna use, you're gonna store it in the ground, mm -hmm. so you don't need exotic metals to store it. And this is what they did in Canada, and I worked on a similar project um, in Amherst for UMass Amherst. You're using polyethylene pipe for transmission. You're using polyethylene pipe for the ground loop. <laughs> and there's an outfit in Skokie, Illinois, that's making ethylene from carbon dioxide and hydrogen. <laughs> you can pull the CO2 out of the air, you can get the hydrogen as renewable hydrogen. Mm -hmm. So you've got something that's fully renewable. Now, it's not going to solve all of your problems, but mm -hmm. it's going to make a big dent in what you have to supply with electricity. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that you're burying polyethylene pipe, you're mm -hmm. sequestering carbon. And you don't mm -hmm. have to worry about carbon under high pressure leaking back out to a fissure in the rock. Polyethylene pipe 
doesn't really decompose. No, it doesn't decompose. And so, I, I, and, and so you, you raise a very valid point, which is that electrification is one part of the solution. To be, to be clear, it is a transition. It is not an overnight cut break. And it will require many, many different technologies working in harmony just because the scales of economy and the local conditions will permit engineering to function only so far because, because the solution will be derived. Oh no, you're, you're, at, you're, you're absolutely correct and it depends too on the political climate. The Japanese love their hydrogen. That's why the Toyota's building hydrogen fuel cell cars, fuel cell trucks, but also because they have the infrastructure to support that as well, whereas for the US, breaking that kind of infrastructure out would be much more costly. But no, very, 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 very valid point there. Hello, Doctor. I just want to say thank you for the uh, talk. Super informative. Uh, my question kind of is kind of in regards to cost efficiency and cost effectiveness versus sustainability, because mm -hmm. I know that's typically a conversation that comes up in kind of these initiatives. So mm -hmm. I'm just wondering in terms of your approach, kind of how you kind of tackle that kind of discussion and I'm assuming, you know, with technological advancements in your manufacturing process, mm -hmm. um, you know, cost of goods or whatever it may be, those fixed yep. costs are obviously going to come down. So I was just wondering if there's any data sets or data points or anything that you guys were specifically looking at in terms of kind of investors or return on investments or how you guys typically present this kind of data uh, in terms of that discussion of sustainability versus cost efficiency, just because at times I, I typically struggle with, you know, presenting no, that's, that. That, that, that. That's a fantastic point right there. And so to, to kind of keep this in a, in a short summary, right? The theme that we operate on is zero emissions, okay? So, that, so that, that is our baseline right there. So the question then for us is, how many recycle loops do we need? How do we, how do we diversify our product portfolio from the tailings, for instance, to ensure that you get value from every single component? And more often than not, we found it's a product market fit. Being able to ensure that whatever you're making is something that someone is willing to take. You figure out your costs based off of that. And if it's a commodity, well, okay, you have to pay whatever commodity price is available. If it's something that's much more exotic, if it's something that you can provide an extra, an extra value to, well, then you have a cost plus or similar model based off of that. And when we think about scaling, so f take a step back, uh, in the metallurgical industry, the name of the game is economies of scale. You want big. You want to lower your labor. You want to lower your overhead, you know, per per reactor, if you will. You want to minimize all the key factors and try to keep your capital as limited as possible for that one particular unit. And so when thinking about the recycling, one thing that is a philosophy of whenever we develop a process is how do I take an intermediate and use it somewhere else? So for instance, we've got, we've got one occasional product that comes out of one of our systems on the metallization, it has great value in the separation. We love it for that. And what would normally be a thrown out material based on conventional processes, we designed the chemistry so that it can be fully recycled so that we recoup everything there. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, what uh, percentage of my Tesla battery will it be possible to reuse when it's time to throw it away? Okay. There's two answers to that question. The first answer is on a metals basis, all of it. The second answer is how good's your recycling technology. One of the key issues with batteries right now is that the battery chemistry is changing as well as the packaging with it. So if I have a process that is built for what are called NMC, nickel, nickel, nickel manganese cobalt batteries, and then new Teslas come out that have lithium iron phosphates, I should be able to recycle the lithium. That is a universal component. But my ability to recycle the iron and the phosphate may not be there because my original process was designed for the, for the nickel manganese cobalt style battery. And that will really vary with the recycling facility itself. But in principle, all the, material, all the metals should be fully reusable. Minus your entropy losses, I should add. Uh, so right now there are pyrometallurgical facilities in China. Their recoveries are north of 98%. Granted, there are consequences that come with how they operate. So then now you're bringing in the environmental impact as well as another part of the equation. You're always gonna have an entropic loss to be abundantly clear, but it's being able to unify all of those factors in candidly a cost-effective manner that's really the biggest driver. I wanted to ask, how energy intensive is your 
are your processes compared to the original processes for separating metals? Great question. So I'll, I'll speak about just purely about the metallization because this is the easiest one to quantify and to give an example for. The way to think about it is we use electricity, right? So every amp hour, that is my conversion metric, but there's also voltage with it, right? So a typical, a typical rare earth metallization cell will run anywhere between eight and 12 volts. It runs horrifically high for a variety of different reasons. We operate between three and, three and seven. So if I use kind of those midpoints, so five and 10, you're looking at a 50% energy decrease just solely on the voltage. Now granted, there's engineering factors that need to be taken in as well, your thermal losses, there's a whole other host, but just purely on a metal kilogram to metal kilogram basis from voltage, you're looking at 50%. Uh, so, do you see this process applying to other sources of brine? I'm thinking of seawater plus desalinization processes. Okay. On the refining side, the technologies can work. Because again, we specialize in making the metals, we, sep we specialize in separating them. And that's what brine is. Brine is a mix of metals. Brine is a mix of metals that once you separate, you can make metal from it. Magnesium is a really good example of that, actually. On the extraction on the brine side, we do have, we think of them as modules, we do have two modules for it. Uh, they are more meant for lithium and strontium. So it really depends on what you're trying to get out of the brine. First, thank you for the, the talk. It's been very interesting. Um, I'm curious, is Phoenix Tailings um, at a point where it is able to, to sell some of these metals? And I'm also curious if you have ideas on expansion of, of Phoenix Tailings. Um, and then my husband wanted me to ask if you had a paper. <laughs> okay, uh, question one. Um, and to staring at me back there. <laughs> yes, we've, yes, we've sold some metal. Yes, um, the, the metal is out in the wild, if you will. Can't say to whom, but it's out there. Uh, to your second question, expansion plans. We are looking at scaling up. We have a facility right now, it's running our pilot. We already have engineering diagrams for certain processes that look at the hundreds of tons on for, for one set and then thousands of tons for the other. And now we're going through the engineering work needed to scale those up because we need to go from a pilot to a full demonstration. And as you get those economies of scale, then your economics become much, much more visible, especially on a granular basis. And as for a paper, we have never actually published a paper as Phoenix Tailings, funny enough. Um, I'm quite secretive about that. There is my dissertation, if you want to wade through that. <laughs> Uh, I do have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm very interested in your, your conceptualization and the circularity, and, mm -hmm. but I have noticed that you haven't talked much about carbon, so I'm curious mm. whether you have any ideas or thoughts about uh, carbon chemistry and recycling of plastics and so on and so Got forth. It. Uh, these All right, big so, so, this, this, so this is my Achilles heel. I'm not an organic chemist. <laughs> um, candidly, the CO2 gone was our first foray into that directly. Once you get into carbon chemistry, that is much simpler in certain fashions and also much more difficult in others because organic chemistry and all of these carbon products, if you will, they're all derivations, but the complexity of carbon is such that unless you know exactly what you want to make, you don't really have a defined process per se. You know, you can, you can do end chain reactions, you can try carbonizing, um, the, the, the old classic is uh, making what's called a high density graphite. You know, that's another variation of it, but now you're going to inorganic carbon. So that's something that's outside of our wheelhouse at the moment. You know, give me another 10 years and I'll have a crack at plastics. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much for the talk. It's been amazing. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to just ask about when you say about this, that we're heading for electrification. I think that's great. I think mm -hmm. it's, it's what I'd like to see. But um, does it become, uh, you know, how, 
the, it does it kind of eat itself in terms of how much energy it takes to reclaim some of these metals from old batteries and things like that? You know, mm -hmm. or does, it, does it work out? You know, I don't know. Yeah, so, so this is the big question of the LCA. How do you do your math? If I were to look at this as a pure scientist and thermodynamicist, entropy is always going to eat away at your life cycle capacity, right? So the longer a time scale you look at, the more in favor the LCA begins to work for these materials because the lifespan of a hydrocarbon being used as energy is a handful of seconds versus if I look at a metal over the course of 100 years, right? So as you begin to look at longer time scales, the LCAs begin to, the life cycle analysis begins to work more and more in your favor. The key is having processes that keep that parity or keeping you at parity or above parity along the way. And that's the big issue right now with all the recycling technologies. And this is where I cannot frankly comment as much because we're not recyclers in the conventional sense. We're looking more so at tailings as a primary source. Hi, uh, my question has to do with uh, why did you choose the hub and spoke model for, for doing what you're doing? And yeah. have you considered the um, safety issues with transporting all this different type of tailing all into Burlington? No, no, that's, that, that's a fantastic question. That's more of an operational answer there. One is the tailings will remain at, the, the tailings will be treated at the site and the bulk of the material will be locally sold, okay? The high value materials, that concentrate I spoke about, that's what ships. And that stuff is, that stuff is as inert as place and. There's, there's no categorical hazard other than don't eat it, basically. Uh, as for the stability of the, the stability of oxides, I mean, if you look all around us, these are all different forms of oxides, the, the bricks, the cement. So as long as you create a form factor that is safe and easy to ship, that's commonly done all over the world right now. Your nickel, your copper, your rare earths, they're already traded in those formats. So what do you actually bring? So you're saying your process will be done at the site, so, the tailing sites. Yeah, so the tailings will give us the concentrate, the rare earth concentrate, but the final metal, that goes to the centralized facility. Oh, okay. And the reason for that, to give a little bit more clarity, is it's process control. Mm -hmm. These are very, very sensitive processes and you wanna have the highest amount of control because the purities that are required for final end products, you're talking in the 99% plus in some cases. So you wanna have that level of precision, you want to have that direct level of control on the processes. Yeah, I guess, um, you know, like some of the synthetic fuels, you know, like mm -hmm. where you take algae and, you know, generate synthetic yep. fuels. The challenge has always been more in terms of, you know, the ability to scale yep. and then also the cost. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in terms of your processes, mm. are you seeing like cost competitiveness? And like you, you've illustrated, yeah. right now the, um, <clears throat> you know, most mining has moved to third world countries. Mm -hmm because you know that way we don't have to pay yep for you know the uh you know the pollution and the impact of that yeah definitely so you know with i mean with human nature mm -hmm. i mean are you banking on that we all become angels and no not that, at all that cost is you know going to be paid by people or nope. you know we're, we're we're selling at market commodity prices okay so you're able to compete yes yes you have to there, there's, there's no way around it. No subsidy in the world will ever be able to maintain you that long. So, when, so to kind of go one step further as well, we're thinking about automation. How do we make these environments safe for people? And also, how do we have multiple cells running from one control room? Okay, and you think about the environmental cost, the cost of disposal. It goes back to a question that was asked earlier, recycling all of the, all of the intermediates that we have in our systems. Mm -hmm. We want to think about one other thing as well, which is, the actual cost of capital, right? right. This, these, we do, I don't want to reinvent the wheel. I don't, need a, I don't need an engineering firm to build me a custom cell when the aluminum industry, the magnesium industry already has a core model that I can piggyback off of and do the last 10% of conversion. So it's, it's leveraging all of these mega scale industries compared to us because for rare earths, you know, 280,000 tons, that's, yeah, it's, it's tiny that's about. tiny. So if I, you know, if the aluminum industry already does 30 million, one of their cells will do a boatload of material for whatever we're doing. 